No way you'll kill me. I can play. No, you can't. It's easy, I'll show you. We formed in about 92. That was uh, me, Rat, and Azza. Well, actually, what 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 started it was was Azza bought a keyboard and had, had had it for a few weeks, and he was uh, sort of getting to grips with the basics of it. And he, he brought it round mine, and he was uh, had a decent ham and sound. Well, like, what at the time we thought was a decent ham and sound on it. It was probably a big Yamaha thing or whatever, but a decent time and sound on it and he was trying to you know he was playing playing a few little uh little scroll licks on it um, had a keyboard learning how to play it obviously um he's going down brigger's house and we'd mess about brigger had a good ear for the tune so we'd uh, try and knock up some um, chords together some score sounding riffs and then, well, probably at first, we spent more time drinking tea or getting pissed than we didn't do anything. But... He had a mate, Rat, who could play guitar, who could, um, who'd been playing for a while. So Rat came down, brought his uh, acoustic with him. I didn't know Rat. Well, I knew Rat played guitar. We asked Rat come down. Uh, so the three of us then were knocking a few tunes about. There's a couple of people right and as is new. And then we advertised for a couple of people and it came from that really. I joined the band in 1993 and I was just walking along East Field Road in Shelley and uh, that was there uh, in his van. Beckoned me over and said to uh, can you play bass? Do you want to join a band? So I said, yeah, I can play bass. Well, it's old fashioned anyway. Um, we knew Red of Chelly, he was a bit of a mod. You know, you see him up and down, his parker on and stuff. We knew he played guitar. So we asked him, and he was up for it. He was a good musician, Red. Um, he could play a bit of bass and he could play guitar. Um, and as I came round our house, and I just knocked off these bass lines that I picked up by ear, and that was good enough for that. So it's got my type of music anyway, all that kind of music connected with skinheads, mods and punks, and all this like that kind of music. We advertised for a few people and various people came down and auditioned and all this time we we had started rehearsing in a, a place on Chelly for State called the Play Scheme, which would you could hire very cheap. Um, so we'd go and set up there and make as much noise as you want because it was basically in the middle of a field. And our first rehearsal was in the, um, the Play Scheme building which was kind of an adventure playground called Youth Club, a community place kind of thing. It was playing guitar. So there's basically, from that, from there, it was just the four of us. As on keys, Rat on guitar, Brigger on guitar, and me on bass. I think we did what most bands at that time did is if you're looking for someone post a load of posters on every music shop in the city on notice boards and stuff like that i was in a rock a sort of school rock band and uh, the guitarist out of that band saw advertisements in the local newspaper and uh, rung up uh, they're advertising for a drummer. Uh, he was a guitarist and uh, yeah, rung up just on the off chance to see if he could join the, the band. The band were just starting out, as a rat, brigger. We'd had all kinds of weird drummers turning up and it was just like becoming a nightmare, auditioning people and telling them they, they weren't right for the band. Then this young kid 
turned off with his dad. You're thinking, oh, here's another one. And he started playing the drums and he was like, wow, he was dead fast. I mean, he was playing rock, but he was dead fast. He was solid. And uh, we thought, he'll do for us. So we, that was Yates, he was 14 at the time, I think. So I come down, remember me dad, bringing me down uh, to the old uh, play scheme at Shelley, which was very nice. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was very cold. And basically we just got together, just put a beat together and uh, had a little jam. I saw an advert in Route 66 Music in Hanley. Uh, advertising for various musicians for a uh, scar band. I'm pretty sure the advert says something like a, a hard edged two tone scar band. One of our friends, Dave Johns, he was willing to shout down a microphone. I decided at that time that, that I didn't fancy the I didn't fancy it myself, I'd, I'd, I'd be quite happy behind the scenes. Yeah, uh, Harry the sax player responded to the same advert, if I remember correctly. Then we met up for the first time in uh, what we call the, the play scheme in Charlie, which is some kind of youth club type building. Yeah, pretty sure the advert was a picture of the Dance Craze album cover. Caught my eye. Obviously, I wasn't looking for a, a ska band particularly to join at the time because there weren't any ska bands. Uh, just looking, having a nose around, could do joining the band, and yeah, saw them there and thought, well, that'd be great. We knew Dave. Um, he was, I think, he'd, he'd done a bit of singing in different bands before or whatever. So we, and he was big into ska and um, skinhead reggae and stuff. And uh, he came along and. Uh, decided he'd, be, he'd do the vocals. Um, Brigger decided to come off the guitar. He reckoned I should I should play the guitar, so we've got a, me on rhythm guitar and Rat on rhythm lead guitar. So we and Brigger were just, uh, just doing backing vocals and stuff. Yeah, well, Brigger had been uh, there from day one, founding member. Um, as the band started, really, um, Brigger decided he wasn't actually going to be in the band as such. He wasn't going to play anything. He was, he was just happy to um, help out and whatever. You know, he, he wrote a few songs and stuff. Get up, get up. Well, that's the beginnings of the band. I had no uh, intention of singing in the band, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to learn the guitar. I, mean, I couldn't play it a bit now, but not much. But I knew that I wasn't going to be good enough to, if we were going to go for it and actually try and do a few gigs. God forbid. But I was quite happy to stay, stick around until um, until we got a full lineup, and then we'd go from there and see what happened. Early rehearsals were basically us pissing around. Um, 
we'd turn up, we'd set up wherever we were going to rehearse, we'd set up and it was usually harder to be honest, it came up with something and played around with it and played around it. You come up with a bunch of chords, obviously back then they were very, it was very basic like, but we'd come up with something we liked and we'd play it over and over and over and uh, occasionally somebody would put some words to it. Good fun straight from the off. It was obviously the, the other guys were learning the instruments at the time. Myself and Harry were uh, had been in bands before, so we've been we were probably a bit more uh, capable on the instruments. But yeah, no problem. It was, uh, it was obvious from day one that the uh, the enthusiasm was there, and certainly they knew what they wanted to do. So yeah, came along for the ride, and uh, yeah, it's been a. Uh, a good, a good fun journey ever since. And once you got a, uh, a lineup, obviously we started rehearsing. We've got, um, we do a few covers as all bands do when we first start. Um, try not to do obvious covers. We're doing um, album tracks more than hits. Of, um, the two turn bands or Skinhead reggae stuff. Um, but we we set out from day one. We said we want we want to be we want that hard edge two term sound. We don't want to be um, you know like kids TV theme score happy happy happy. We want to say something and have an edge, have some anger. So we decided we were we were definitely having the two guitars like the specials and the selector ad, and um, we pretty much stuck to that. And that everyone came together on that. We essentially, as a band, I think our, our influences were pretty varied, actually. But um, I was always into the two tone. That was my that was my era. That was my time. Um, and obviously, the Trojan skin and reggae stuff. I love that. And punk. You know, punk and all. Our influences were the same from day one, really. Uh, the two-tone ska bands, particularly the, the special selector beats. Uh, say very early madness uh, and early bad manners type sound. That's what we we're trying to achieve. But then always mixed in with uh, punk sound, as much punk as possible. Two-tone was the biggest influence behind Roof Cuts. Without a doubt. Uh, so yeah, so the the early rehearsals, I think we used to rehearse at least every week, sometimes twice a week. I think back then, trying to get things accelerated, get it done quickly. We're still learning his instruments at the time. Well, most of us were. Um, so we're all as well as learning songs, we're also learning off each other, really, and. We've got the sound that we were looking for. We've got, um, like I say, that bit of edginess to it with the two guitars. Yeah, the, so when we started out uh, on the early rehearsals, uh, obviously they realised that how young I was, uh, being 14, stroke 15, going into the 15. Uh, I think they were a bit concerned how young I was at the time. Uh, but uh, in the end, they, they chose me as one of the originals. So uh, yeah, he went from there. Us four were coming up with ideas for original songs. As I was round at my place, uh, you know, coming up with lyrics and tunes, and I'd come up with chord sequences, and just just basically to get some kind of arrangement to all the songs, you know, so. So that's when the sound really started to form and we were, we were definitely going for the hard edge ska sound, uh, the two guitar sound, the more punk sound, uh, shying away from the, uh, the, the pop ska sound that was, was very much prevalent at the time. 
we started getting a few tunes together, uh, it sounded uh, it got potential. In the rough cuts, if you didn't give your opinion, if you didn't say what you wanted, you'd be driven by other people. I wrote a lot of songs, as I wrote a lot of the songs. Other people wrote the mu you know, as I wrote a lot of the music. Other people have to chip in because if you don't chip in, you don't get your influences in there, do you? You can't really give an opinion if you don't give an opinion. Very early days we started doing, obviously as all bands you start uh, learning different cover versions, putting your sound onto that, but very quickly we're writing our own songs and doing our own tunes, all, all doing our bit for that. Uh, and that's how the, the set started to form. And uh, yeah, I think, yeah, our first actual gig was also at the Shelley Thwerky Men's Club as well. So from then on, it was just a matter of getting tight and properly looking for gigs. Uh, the early rehearsals were actually a big, just a massive learning curve. They were just... It wasn't so much songs coming together, it was the people playing the instruments coming together and actually learning to play their instruments, you know. Once we'd moved out of the uh, play scheme, then we started to get something of a better sound getting together. Uh, we started rehearsing at the Chelly Working Men's Club, uh, and the, the band members started to stabilise. Uh, still had people join us that weren't officially in the band. I'm thinking people like Brigger uh, be certainly helping out with the, the songs. My van had three stereos stolen out of it whilst, I was, uh, whilst we were rehearsing at the, the Chelly the Working Men's Club. Happy days. Yeah, in the early days, um, away from practices, I'd go down uh, Brigger's house, um, Rat's house, I'd go down Red's a lot. Um, just messing about with different chords and um, we'd play around until we got a good sound or a good set of chords we liked and then we'd take them to rehearsal um, and see if we can come up with some it, a song or you know write some words and then take them to rehearsal but uh, yeah sort of put the time in early doors and uh, managed to get uh, enough songs to get a set together. I can't remember much about the, the very early set other than uh, Friday night would definitely would have been in it. We still play that today. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we played a selector cover, Murder, in the set. Other than that, yeah, I can't remember what else we would have played. first gig it was at the Chally British Legion I mean we got the ball rolling went on to get a few gigs under his belt you know early gig memories to me are probably the best memories because the, the very early gig memories I wasn't in the band I was I was roadieing and I was um, getting drunk basically, I'll do the sound check and then Dave Johnson jump on the mic if he turned up. Dave. In the first game we were like um, rabbits in headlights. Just uh, was family and friends, everyone was shitting themselves and uh, we got through that and then we started doing some decent gigs, so I think picking up a good following. Obviously when we started we were gigging in and around Stoke. Yeah, the early gigs were pretty mad really. Um, <laughs> it was more like a party at times, everybody got involved. We hyped ourselves up and we got a quite a good little local following, you know. We, we, we were guaranteed to sort of you get 100 people in when people, you know, <laughs> a lot of bands were struggling to get 20 people in. Mm. 
you know, so the, the landlords and that quite like that. The Oasis gigs in Stone, they were mental. We were taking a coach load of people with us and stuff. Um, playing the Alam Shiro Tal, some gigs around Stoke at the Wheat Chief, um, supporting our manners, I think, in various sort of gigs. With, um, we did a lot with a really good local punk band at the time called Destination Venus. We did a, quite a few gigs with them. Uh, they were good lads. <laughs> four songs together and um, we went to and recorded them at Abbey Sounds Studios in Rusley which uh, seemed like a lot of bands from around our way um, used that studio at the time. <laughs> and we were pretty pleased with them at the time, uh, the outcome. And, um, it was quite nerve wracking at times, and obviously, the first time you've been put under pressure to play without making mistakes. Um, obviously, nicking the beer from the snooker hall downstairs and getting pissed probably didn't help us all, but hey ho. First time hearing your own stuff played back to you um, in a studio environment, it's really exciting stuff. The very early gigs, the ones that really kind of spring to mind, uh, the ones we played at the Oasis Bar in Stone, uh, played there a couple of times, supported, did we support, I can't remember, we played, we played with other bands anyway, definitely, uh, and they were just a great laugh, chaotic, loads of mates down there, big piss up, uh, damage, uh, broken bones probably. Uh, but all, all in good spirits, all a good laugh. Uh, we used to play at some really tiny venues. I think at one point there was like seven or eight of us in the band and we played a, a pub in Stoke that was like a long narrow pub and we'd stand, stand two abreast, uh, stand in pairs like four deep <laughs> as a band.
and when we, we first started playing outside of Stoke, we play in uh, places like Sheffield, the Hallamshire Hotel in Sheffield, and they're always great gigs. Uh, and that they were really good because we were starting to see people from outside the area, people we didn't know, people who were seeing us for the first time, uh, and met the likes of uh, like Spike for one, uh, people like Willow, uh, people that are just into the music from around the country. Um, those early gigs, um, they were fantastic because there was a little bit of a hype around us at the time because we were playing slightly faster stuff, slightly more aggressive stuff. Um, it seemed to go down quite well. <laughs> The Sheffield gigs, the Hallam shit, things like that. Oh man, they were fantastic because, and don't get me wrong, it was the locals because the, the you and you turn up for play a gig. Yeah, you can flyer it and you can you can have a manager who, who you know promotes the hell out of it. But at the end of the day, <laughs> the atmosphere is all down to the people that turn up. And then people in Sheffield they wanted a good night out. Believe me, and the Alamshire, they really got into it. And we felt quite at home there. We played a couple of gigs there, and it went mental every time. I ended up going on stage that night and doing the set, which was fine because I knew the set because I'd practiced it because they, they didn't like coming rehearsal very often. So I knew the set, I'd wrote some of the songs. Dave Johns ended up leaving and Brigger, who knew all the words anyway, because obviously he, he used to, he was at every single rehearsal and he, as I say, he wrote some some of the songs anyway he took over the vocals but I, I didn't really have any desire to be the front but anyway that's what happened rather than try and organize things ourselves maybe it was time we had somebody take charge because we were absolutely chaotic this is my story, it's keen, it's symphony. It's keen, it's symphony. It's keen, it's symphony. Yeah, we had a good relationship with Porky and um, for quite a while. It's keen, it's symphony. We met Porky from down south and he got us on quite a few gigs down London and decided um, that we we'd have him as our manager. Uh, he introduced us to Mark Foggo and he signed us for Skanky Lil Records and that's what Better Rough came out on. I say he had a lot of contacts, he, he was he was probably at that time in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, he was, he was the man 
who organised all the gigs. He, he was organising gigs for Bad Manners plus support. He was getting, you know, he was getting some decent names. Uh, he was he was a major player on the ska scene at a time where, you know, it needed it. Oh wow! What was that about a rough cuts? Well, right, well, that was for over twenty years. Uh, my name's Paul Key, and back in the day, nineteen ninety-seven, we had a phone call from someone saying they played in a band, and could they come away down to camp from Stoke on Trent to play at my "Where the Baby's Head Do" with the, the riffs and the explosions? I do remember. Uh, I said I had a full lineup, but they were insistent, so I said, "Hey, home, more the merrier." So they come down and done this gig for me uh, after they played football, five side against the Riffs, and after they drank all the um, booze backstage, which the other band were very happy about. But I'm still here. This time, John's uh, left the band and uh, Brigitte took over on vocals. And uh, uh, we, not long before we did our first album, I met uh, Jai, also from Chalif. Uh, we went to mine, sort of jammed about for a bit. I played chords and like stir it up, Bob Marley really went well so I just passed a message on about Jai you know he a good singer well we'd grown up on the on the estate with um, the Faulkners it was Jai and his obviously his brothers Jason Gazza and we knew Jai well we got an idea Jai could sing a little bit so <laughs> we said to Carl because you live you live opposite him you'd call when you see him asking if he fancies doing a couple of songs coming for a rehearsal so Jai came along yeah he could sing um, gave us a a chance of doing some more slower numbers really a little bit more reggae um, and that Jai officially joined the band then and then I think we just started rehearsing then for recording the, next, the first album A Bit Rough My first memory of the band was in 1998 when I met Carl Redfern on the estate and he asked me if I wanted to do a few songs and he had one particular song called Hurt Again and we went down to the rehearsal room and we were there for about two and a half hours just churning out um, a scar, scar reggae, it was magical, it was a good night, I loved it. You know, it's like, hopefully, like, we got him. You know, Brigger had the aggro, and Jai had the soul. Bit of Rough was the first studio album for the band, and it was the first time I'd gone in the studio. So I was a bit nervous. It was done at the barracks in Newcastle, and it was the first time we'd all done this and uh, I think we did it all in a, a weekend, the recording at least. Very rough, um, I'm guessing. Um, it's the same for a lot of bands really. Um, it was pretty much our live set. We went in the studio and recorded that. I had nothing to be nervous about. It, it went really good. The lads helped out, supporting each other. It was a great atmosphere in there. I think we soon learned that we had a quite short attention span and we were getting bored pretty quickly, which meant the, the piss taking was flying early doors. Uh, but we got there in the end, we completed it and uh, yeah, sounds okay today. It's a bit rough around the edges, but then what would you expect? It was a... Uh, it certainly reflected what we were like as a band at the time. Probably changed a lot now, given the chance, but at the time we were pretty pleased with it. As our debut album, it proved very popular. 
because we wanted to get everything right, you see. We wanted to strive for perfection. We went in there not knowing at all the, the etiquette in a recording studio, what you do, what you don't do. We just basically, nobody's told, nobody tells you. You just go in there. And of course, to the sound engineer, you want to act like this is what you do every day. Like, we just have a fucking clue. <laughs> We're just winging it. I hurt again, obviously. Emma Rude Boy, Johnny Too Bad, I'm Loving You, Crazy About You. You know, it was great. To be fair to Mark Fogger, he got that album all over the place. And it got us got us some good reviews and some decent gigs as well. But um, Mark Fogger, yeah, he, he had his own label, Skanky Lil. So obviously we did a bit of rough and touted it around a bit. And, and he came over to see us play in a gig in... I think it was Camden, Underworld, with Bad Manners. I mean, Johnny Too Bad cover. I love that. I absolutely love it. And Joy, Joy did a damn good job as well. When his head was on, Joy was on it. Believe me, he was very, very talented. It went down well when it got released. What you doing with my we gigged off that, the back of that album for a couple of years, played all around Europe. Um, fantastic. That album went around really well, and, and, and to be fair to Skanky Lil, they did get it, get it everywhere, it went all over the world. I like Supergrass off there. I like What Goes Around. I also like, obviously, Friday Night. I like that because that was sort of... I wrote... That was probably the first... You know, the second song I wrote for the band. It was the first proper effort of a song that I wrote. How many stories can I tell you? Just from Belgium to Holland to the north of England, to London, some of the best venues that they played at. And uh, it was my pleasure to be their manager for the time I was. And uh, I all become very good friends of mine, uh, something you never forget. That album, although yes, the production, when you listen to it, the production is not great on it. You know? it, was, it wasn't a major studio, it wasn't major money spent on it. But there's a sort of rawness about that album, what I like. I like it, I like that album. And there might be the odd cheesy thing on there, but that's experience, isn't it? Like, you know, we might not record some of those songs again. But there's still some songs on that album which which um, st stand the test of time, I think. My favourite uh, songs off, off that album, very rough, would probably be Supergrass. I tried to sort of write a story there. That was one of the, it's always a, been a favourite of mine, and I still like the sound of Hurt, Hurt Again. Really um, melancholy reggae song um, I think Jai's vocals are quality on that song so yeah them two probably stick out for me on that album It came about from a, a conversation I had with Rat at a selector gig in, in, at the Limelight in Crew, and uh, basically we were talking history this that and the other I let it slip I'd been in the army I'd been a bugler in a corps of drums and he says oh can you play a trumpet bands him in a band and bands after a trumpet player I said well I can play a trumpet I can blow one upshot was uh, a week later I met Azza uh, rap brought him down to my mum's house where I was I don't know what he, what he thought of me 
There's me dismantling a chimney in the back of my mum's house, covered in shite. I fell in love with the music, the energy and the, the vibrancy of, 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 of what it was about. It was very two-tone inspired. It was, it was up-tempo. Uh, there was a... That, that is, there was a real mix in that album of, of, of subtle reggae tunes and, and in-your-face, street ska, fighting tunes that told stories. And if you're working class and you've come from, you know, the that side of the tracks, so to speak, it just it just it, it hit me, it both ears, and that was it. I, I, I was hooked. We sat about, you know, learning some stuff. Airy was the sax player at the time, so we did some work with him. We worked on simple stuff because I wasn't a particularly proficient trumpet player. Um, and it just sort of worked. It, it, you know, we kept it simple. It, it, the tunes worked. So we just, we, we set about, you know, uh, me rehearsing, getting familiar with the material to a point where I got up to my first gig. And my first gig, as I remember it, was, it was, I, I think, it was a Porky Promotions gig at the at the Open Anchor in London, in Islington. Uh, and I remember being quite excited about going there because it had been a you know as a, as a young as a kid living the post punk thing and the punk thing. I sort of I, 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 that the Open Anchor it was like it was like a, a mecca for, for for you know for a lot of the bands who who, who I was who had followed who was interested in. Then we, we decided after a while of gigging to do another album. So we had some, we had quite a bit of new stuff written, and we had stuff what we were we were playing anyway. Um, new stuff what we were playing, I didn't like, and and that all came about. And then Welcome to Our World came about, which was which was like our difficult second album, because the first album. Well, you ask any any band that our first album went went down pretty well, so it sort of ups the ante a little bit, doesn't it? Because you want to at least match it. You don't want to go backwards, do you? Uh, a lot of bands do. We don't. I don't think we did. I, I think it's a decent album. It stands on its own. Um, my favourite track on that album, probably "Selling Out Your Class." I love that song. Really like that song. Did it live for a while. Um, Round Our Way. Round Our Way. Uh, uh, that's one of Az's songs. In fact, Az had wrote quite a bit on that one, actually. Um, yeah, Round Our Way had been knocking around for a couple of years. I think it was even knocking around when we did the first album. It's just it wasn't ready. Or else that would have probably been on the first album. Um, work. That's a good song. Recorded the uh, Welcome to Our World at um, Prism in Stoke. Um, really good studio and Sean Lowe, very experienced studio engineer. Um, proper step up for us. Um, Sean being a perfectionist and us being far from perfect as a band. Um, we got the job done. Very pleased with uh, the results. During the second album, Booty, we did most of our album with Booty, but during that album, he left and he was replaced by Iggy. And also, we got Thingy on board here, Graham Stumpy, 
he's a trumpet player and vocalist, so, you know, just getting, going from strength to strength, really. Yeah, there was a, a few people coming and going. And we'd been going for a few years by then, probably, well, 10, 10 years, like, yeah, by then. So, it wasn't new anymore. We we got a bit of experience and we sort of, you know, we sort of hoped we knew what we were doing. We went in there, recorded it, it sounded good. Um, that came out, that went down pretty well. We recorded the, the second album, at which I'd put you know a bit more on, a bit more uh, trumpet work on, and some backing vocals because say Jai started when we started the album. Jai was singing with the band, and by the time we'd finished, it, it left. I, I so would so would um, Booty was the bass player then, um, but at the start of the recordings, and by the time we finished the album, Iggy was on bass. So and and they had a, a, a contrasting style. So you'll you'll hear that on the album. It's quite it's, it's quite evident. A lot of a lot of record companies. If you said you wanted a like a, a ten-page, fifteen-page booklet with all the lyrics in and photos and all this with it, like they'd be like, yeah, whatever. You know, if you buy a lot of CDs and there's like a cover, a CD inside and a back cover, if you're lucky, with a track listing. And we had we had like a magazine in with ours. <laughs> <laughs> Favourites probably, I like England's Glory on there, Do You Really Love Me, Life's Too Short, um, yeah, it's a good album, slightly more brassy sound than we uh, we had on the first album I think, but uh, nevertheless again came out on Skanky Low Records and uh, did really well again, um, so pleased with that. <laughs> Uh, that's the uh, last recording I did was uh, Welcome to Our World. Without going into specifics, for some reason, I, I decided I wanted to leave. Um, in hindsight, in hindsight, it was probably a mistake at that time. But if anybody knows me, they know when things when things get a bit much for me, I start I, I disappear. I uh, become a bit reclusive, and I sort of I need to gather my thoughts. This next song's all about Disappeared off the scene for a little bit. Stayed away. I did go, go and see the the guys. I mean, Graham and Take It. Graham, who was doing backing vocals and playing the trumpet, etc. He stepped in. He stepped in and took over. He knew the songs. I've now become the, the, the lead singer of the Rough Cuts, something I'd never alluded to or, or imagined I'd become. Uh, rather, uh, the reluctant singer. But I took it on with gusto. I, what, where I, what I lack in genuine um, musical ability and, and, and skill, I make up for in uh, a gut load of enthusiasm. Uh, and, and energy. I've always, I've always believed that all the time. Whatever music I've played, give it everything you've got. Because, because if you're not, you're selling yourself short. And that's a pun there. You're selling yourself short and selling your crowd short. It 
you know, Graham's a sort. It wouldn't wouldn't have took him long to get the set, and he did 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 a few of them anyway. So. I don't think I, I, I took the band down a direction of I tried to um, sneer stuff a bit like reggae and I tried to sing stuff a bit like Jai but it could never be those people I just tried to be me and do it my way and I had some really positive really positive feedback so then we move on to the third album and by now uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of grown in confidence because I'm a singer. I feel like I could contribute my opinion and it not be scoffed at because, you know, I'm not the singer of the band. It, you've got a little bit more, I don't know, uh, weight behind you, it, uh, uh, for, for, for want of a, a better phrase. And and then, so we goes into the the, uh, the, the studio recording and stuff. And I think, you know, I, have to, I have to be honest, and I'm, and I'm biased because that was my time and that was my album that I sung on. Um, I think that was some of the band's best musical work the 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 the, the, the some of as his pen writing then uh, Chelly uh, you know is, is, a, is a classic for, for anybody that's that's lived on that side of, of a working class you know council estate that type of upbringing you come from that side he just wrote so eloquently about things that had affected him and that song really could be his his life story it, it, it's that cleverly done but it was so delicately put to the music and it just worked They got a gig at the Huntsman in Beersland and they asked me if I'd like to go. So I went, turned up, pumped me down towards me. They got me on stage, which I didn't know about. I goes on stage, performed, did all the backy singing for Graham and absolutely buzzed off it. It was brilliant. Couldn't fault it at all. Thought it was a, a great time. That's how I ended up joining the band. But um, for experience, you just can't beat it at all. You just can't beat it. It's absolutely amazing. Around that way, this man so busy can hardly stand. The women moaning at the back of the hand. It's time for a quickie, so you put her in the club. The shit in the shade, but back down the pub. The painted graffiti splashed all around. Speeding cars of familiar sound. You got no chance. Swanning around with your head up your ass. You're looking down on us, you think you're cool Don't wanna mix with the gathering crowds Don't wanna mix with people like us and I even did some uh, pen writing with Azza, uh, co-writing, he'd come up with the idea, he was great ideas man, he like, oh, oh, where the fuck he got these ideas from, they, they just came to him naturally, be driving around in his van for work and he'd write something down on the back of a bit of paper or a fag packet and, and he'd, he'd bring it in and, and into, the, into, the, into the rehearsal room, because we, we did rehearse pretty much every week, it was, it was a, you know, fucking won't be charged if you missed it, because it was, it was important. <laughs> Stumpy was the um, main vocals and Mucker had joined on vocals as well. Um, and we, we got in touch with Roddy from the specials. Um, I think he said he'd liked some of our stuff before, so he'd like the guest spot. So we brought him up to the studio with us. Um, played through the songs that we'd got. He plugged his guitar in and uh, started doing some uh, licks over different songs. And so Azza being Azza, because he's, he's always, always a cheeky bastard, uh, you know, he fucking get where water wouldn't, that lad. He approached Roddy from the special and said, look, would you be interested in doing some lead guitar work on this album we're currently working on? To which he replied, yeah, of course you would, I'd love to. Which amazed us all. My favourite time in the studio is when Roddy turned up. Oh, it was absolutely brilliant. 
absolutely brilliant. I was, I was, I was actually singing at the time when he turned up, and I could hear everything in what was going on and what was what was being said. And Roddy actually thought, as I got a good voice, me personally, I thought, well, just have these. But Roddy thought I got a really good voice. Uh, obviously, he did the solo on Chelith, and it was like, wow, that's just hope. The freaking studio engineers got that one down. Anyway, luckily he had. I mean, it's unmistakable body radiation sound straight away. He just as soon as he plays it, it's like wow. <laughs> And again, you come into the show, we were all we were all a bit awestruck by him because of who he was. And then he just fucking, you know, he eventually plugged his Gibson in, and uh, and then just at his pedal board straight into the uh, uh, the mixing desk. And fucking, and he just come out with these ah these licks, and it's like, wow, blew me away, blows all away really. Yeah, it's, uh, I think Roddy enjoyed it actually because um, it's pretty laid back in the studio, just having a laugh and joke, no pressure on anyone or whatever. Um, went out for a few beers that night, enjoyed the cells, so really, really good, good memories of that. Song on the album, um, obviously Chelly is the biggest song on there, um, but I really like um, Alone Tonight, um, that's a good song on there I think. Um, Kim Yearsley did a song on there. It was different for us for have a girl vocalist singing. Uh, she did I, I Wanna Make Love. Um, that was that was a good song. My only regret was the way I finished with the band. I would have liked a better finish than, than, than the way the end for me transpired. I, I left the band, me and Azra had, had disputed over, over something, um, not nastily, it was just he had an opinion, I had an opinion, and I think, if I'm, if I'm honest, we're similar in the way that we view things. You know, we we were little fellas who dig our heels in over over something, and neither hell or high water will shift us from that from that stance. So we were at this loggerheads over something, and again, it was between me and Azzy, Um and we just didn't see eye to eye. We couldn't see eye to eye. We probably left some things unsaid. However, you know, we we're, we're sweet now. We've said that we said our pieces at the time, and we spoke about it at length. And we both probably conceded some ground on things. You know, both both accepted that we were probably a little bit stubborn uh, in a stance. But as I say, we're similar men. You know, with with which made us probably make the band work quite well because we were both driven. To, to an end, you know, to, to, to achieve something. As he used to do a bit of DJing, he put a um, one of his nights on, and they were pretty popular. Like you know, he played a bit of he played a bit of ska and he played a bit of Northern Soul and all the stuff he likes, and a bit of punk. I went there, like you know, and saw all the lads again, and had a bit of the crack, and, and drunkenly was talking to Azzy, and somebody persuaded persuaded me to go down for a, a practice session.
don't think there was any plans to do to do another album for a while. It had been a couple of years since since uh, another week, another war. I wrote a song, Gangster's Playground, and we started doing that. And it came together pretty quickly, pretty well. After a few weeks, we, we had a basis of a good song. And started writing a couple more, and as I, as I came in with a couple of songs as well, what I think he probably had on the back burner for quite a while. A lot of people cite favourite Puffcut songs are on this album, uh, Natural Eye, Warriors, Different Day, um, oh, boy, Mr Grimm, Rude oh, Girl. And no stopping the dead end train. To wanna be on the dead end train. I think we released this on RK Records, Rough Cuts Records. That was in the original. But again, um, went down really well, so we can't complain about that. And we've got quite a few of them songs in the in the live set at the time. So uh, yeah, pretty big album for us. He says he says he performs better. On stage, it's got to be Chalith. By far. The crowd used to go nuts. Used to go but no is it Chalith? Used to go nuts. But my personal favourite song, where I used to like singing, and I still do like singing it actually, is called Warriors. Yes, you're in the zone. You're a man. You're a man, you're making scar happen. We we that we are making scar happen. So the rogues they said Warriors, warriors Come out to play So the rogues said Well so the rogues they said Warriors, warriors Come out to play Put it out ourselves We, we, we Like the old days really It was a strange one because we had Probably the best production <laughs> We'd had on an album or oh, the best, and I think the I think one of the strongest lineups of songs as well. But um, we put it out ourselves, but it went well, and that got all that got itself it got itself um, all over the place. That album did. My favourite songs of that album, well, that's without a doubt, is Warriors. I love it. I was jealous that that Mucker got to sing that one all the time. And actually, to be fair, he did a good job on that. It's probably my favourite album, actually. I did write a few of the songs for this. Again, like I say, you get a bit biased when you when you've got a few songs on there. But I, I really like the album. Yeah, my favourites off uh, "Dirty Sex at Midnight" probably or "Adolescent Youth." I like that song. Um, "Monday Morning." That's a different song. I like that. Um, "Clash of the Youth Cults." Um, or "Back to Glory," maybe. Many, many months ago, the early 90s, um, I used to have a, an oi band called Violet of Prey. Um, and my first gig um, with the oi band was with the Rough Cuts in, um, in Rotherham, sunny Rotherham. Um, so basically that's when I met the band for the, for the first time. Um, obviously saw them a few times uh, over the years become good mates with Azza, Rat, Brigger, all the guys. Um, and then fast forward sort of a few years to like sort of January, January 14, 2014, something like that. And I got a message, I went on, on holiday in January, um, the months on holiday, I mean. Um, and it was from Ali, 
Uh, I'll just put the gigs on the road room, say, that, am I going to go for Rob Cut's job, singing job? And I didn't even know that they were after a singer. So I made some inquiries, contacted Rat, he said I were interested, I'm not been out for ages. Um, so yeah, he sent me a few tracks up, I went down for a jam, um, basically, that were it, you know what I mean? I'm in love, basically, you know what I mean? In the case that uh, you're in. I used to run a, a, a ska fanzine, a ska music fanzine called Street Feeling, which was quite popular at the time. Proper cut and paste, you know, the old fashioned way. And, uh, and I used to get stuff sent to me to review. And something came through the letterbox. And I thought, what's this? And it was a cassette. It was a cassette. And it was a cassette by a band called The Roof Cuts, and the song was Moonstomp. And I thought, mm, you know, I'll put this on, great stuff, give it a review. And it was like nothing I'd heard before. Four. Um, we'd had a lot of melodic ska stuff going on around that time in the early 90s, so, which was lovely, you know, great stuff. But this had a real hard edge. And being a big fan of the specials uh, and bands like that, um, they really stood out. The driving hammer and organ, and you know, they're just sharp, edgy. And yeah, I thought, yeah, this is brilliant. You know, you just eat your ear, just prick up. If I had to describe the rough cuts in four words, they would be crazy, chaotic fun but talented I wouldn't change it for nothing I'd do it all again if I had to if I had another life I would do it all again great times you know you know not to mention the gigs I mean it can go on for ages about the gigs you know supporting Selector Instrumental and um, Bad Manners quite a few times so that was good you know Sheffield gigs in Sheffield Wheatsheaf Limelight Camden Belgium Holland oh, I've, I've, we've had like <laughs> I remember seeing him at Whitby and uh, a friend of ours called, called Tony the Reverend as they, they all know him uh, he gives a lift and they came rushing out at the end and tried to tip the car over. <laughs> it's just what they, that's what they're all about. It's just, it's just the fun element of it. But you know, I've heard some cracking stories, some hilarious stuff, and that's how it should be. That's how it should be. That's what it's all about. About being in the band. And you know, we spoke to Hazard recently, and he said the same thing. You know, if if you don't enjoy it, there's no point in doing it. And it's all about enjoyment, isn't it? Um, and stuff like that. But now, they they are without doubt one of this country's top ever scar bands I think. Got too many crazy stories and I wouldn't really want to uh, tell most of them <laughs> but uh, yeah great times and uh, great music and a great band and um, let's hope they keep going for a long time yet. We were what we were, we were working class lads who, who, who had a love for scar, two-tone style inspired music and we lived it out our, our own way. 
Their music has an energy and a, a, it just sucks you in, really. Well, the band Jean, he's a legendary in the early days. I mean, nowadays, we actually have a minibus and everyone has a seat, which is a, a novelty. But in the early days, it was pile a load of patio furniture and settees or whatever in the back of a transit van. Everyone pile in. First one in gets the best seat. Everyone else just makes do with what they can. You sit on the equipment, sit on the drums, whatever. I, mean, I think 20 odd people in a transit van wasn't unheard of. I know it sounds ridiculous now, but it, trust me, it wasn't. I've got a couple of years without seeing has it? And the same humour, the same, the same piss taking, the same stupidity. The next time we see each other, it's exactly the same. It's as if you saw each other yesterday. I met so many famous people, Roddy Byers, fantastic, brilliant guitarist, Neville Staples, Pauline Black. Uh, I also met the Beats, uh, members of Bad Manners, and so on and so on. It was absolutely amazing, can't fault it. Um, over the years, I've had many great adventures with them, <laughs> done some mad things, things that I would never have thought of doing and thought of myself doing, but uh, they um, are an amazing bunch of people to be with. Um, great friends, um, but completely out crazy. If you can't cope with crazy, then you can't cope with the rough cuts. Aha, the rough cuts, I remember them well. About 15 years ago, I reckon, because they bought me a 50th birthday present when I first met them, a Zippo lighter, and had it engraved. Great lads, great time with them. I recorded uh, some guitar for them on their album at the time, and Shelley, still one of my favorite songs. And we toured, toured Germany and Czechoslovakia, it was like being on tour with the Bass Street kids. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the van journeys were epic. Um, I don't really want to go into individual stories too much because you could literally fill, you could fill a couple of hours of DVD with stories about the van. But let's just say I've witnessed everything from fights at 40 mile an hour, um, people defecating and urinating out of the back of moving vehicles onto the vehicles behind because they didn't realize that's what would happen which is bloody obvious I've seen I've seen cows cow surfing yes it's a thing um, The sight of the sight of Cole Bailey holding on to the tail of a cow as it's dragging him through shit on the field. Um, people walking across rugby posts off the middle and snapping them. Saturday gigs down in London it was a fantastic day out. It was like being a child again, being on being on being on the van with 30 children, acting pathetically. It, it, and it was just, it was, it was, a, it was a ball. You know what I mean? Like-minded individuals in terms of apparel and like, and like and choice of music. The rough cuts never do anything simple. They never organise anything properly. They never uh, have a plan B. Uh, half the time I've got a plan A. Anybody who's into ska music. Seriously, across Europe at least, should know what Chell Heath is. If you mention the song Chell Heath, the song titled Chell Heath, you must understand. You know, it's anthemic, you know, um, and you don't get that a lot often anymore, I don't think. I don't think you do get anthems anymore. But that is a song uh, that strikes with everybody because it's one of those songs written which can apply to anybody uh, who comes from, you know, from that sort of generation not gen no generation from that from the from them from those um, social standings and stuff like that you know counter states and things like that and doing things that are in the song you know we've all done and uh, and it's become really anthemic and you know and it's and it's just one of those things isn't it you know it, you know it deserves better if this band had been around in the sem in 79 they would have been signed up to Tutor and been a massive hit that's the that's the thing about it 
British Bulldog in the back of the van, wrestling. Uh, all stuff you do when you're young and you can recover pretty quickly from. Um, stopping in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, just having piggyback fights in the field, different teams. Uh, yeah, good fun. These were people that would come to every gig. These were people that Azza and Rat grew up with, lived on the same estate. They, they were always there, they were constants. And you could rely on them, you knew. They'd back you up if there was any trouble, they'd back you up, they wouldn't step down. Uh, they'd help you set up, they'd carry stuff in. Uh, Colin would carry stuff out. Yeah, somebody soaked me bad and uh, so then uh, they took toothpaste. I thought toothpaste was for teeth, not for like putting on door handles and on cattle handles and things like that, you know what I mean? Well, that's what they did. Mentally, they were absolutely mental. I think the thing I'll take from the band of my time with them was the merciless ragging of one another. You would rip the piss out of your best mate or all the way down to a gig, through the gig, and all the way back over again. Because you wouldn't survive in, in, in the rough cuts if you couldn't take it or give it. You wouldn't survive, it's brutal. It has to be brutal. You know, it's just the way it is. It's a big piss take. And I remember the saying in a very German voice, where are the rest of the band? And we're saying, in bed <laughs> which rooms are they in well of course we didn't know we just grabbed these keys so we didn't know who were in what room so she kept saying you are on stage in half an hour <laughs> I don't shout I'm just like sort of proper headache here anyway eventually I think it was Rob Lads and Azza were sharing a room and like sort of she, she was banging on every room in hotels trying to find Azza and Rob Anyway, eventually I found her. <laughs> they were characters. They they got on some of the recordings. They did. If we ever had like chants in the backgrounds recorded, they'd be on them. Um, they'd just be there. Every gig, they would be there. And they were priceless. You couldn't, you know, they were our road crew. They were fantastic. Because the uh, rough cuts uh, uh, songs are live is a great experience, proper experience. It was chaos, absolute chaos, brilliant chaos, brilliant chaos. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, you know. I've heard all the stories and cow riding and, and, <laughs> and things like that. You know, but it's um, it's the attitude that the band have as well. You know, they're just down to earth lads. Um, there's no airs and graces. You know what you get with the rough cuts. I seem to remember us uh, in a a Belgian Belgian hostel, and Porky leaving his own calling card in the toilet, which was uh, described by onlookers as a cow pot. Uh, make it up what you will. Scudger, Harry Limer. Um, still has the scars to bear from hitting the windscreen at uh, Full Bore on the way to Wellingborough. It was a good gig, <laughs> but he had an headache though. Jesus, that windscreen never recovered. They always used to close with a scar band on the Sunday. And there must have been some big acts on there that weekend that we played. Uh, I think Howard Jones had been on and a few other bands, you know, who probably, you know, had the, had the best days of their career and were waning, but, you know, it, it, was a, it was a good payer for them. And it was a chance for us to play on, on a big pro stage, you know. I remember getting there and we did this sound check, a, a, a quiet sound check. There was two stages on this big town square, one on the side, one at the top end. Uh, and we were on, we were closing the show. Ah, oh, my! And uh, and they drew back the curtains, and there must have been, I don't know, three, four thousand people. And it was like, fuck me, look at that! And and I know a few. I know, I know, uh, Yatter was the drummer then, and I know he, he proper shit. He was a young lad, said he, he's like he fucking his ass went big time because of the, you know, that's a big crowd looking at you. It's just catch twenty-two. Manhandling female cy cyclists as they go past, uh, which 
although enjoyable, could have been classed as a, a crime. Red was the funniest on one of those uh, tours. He had to be up and into work at like seven o'clock in the morning, something like that on Monday morning. And we were traveling back on the Sunday night from, uh, I think it was Holland, might have been Belgium. Uh, so he decided there was no way he was going to be able to sleep properly on the minibus. So he was going to get shit faced and drank a, a bottle of brandy to try and get himself off to sleep so he could have a good night's kip. Unfortunately for him, he, uh, he drank a bottle of brandy and just got pissed, didn't go to sleep, and was turfed into work at seven o'clock in the morning off his face. And I got on top of the lighting rig, and I must have been, you know, 30, 37, 38 foot up, walking across some scaffolding, doing my madness fucking dance. And honestly, it was just, I'll never forget it. The gig was brilliant, and, and to be treated like professionals, even though we were the most unprofessional professionals you've ever fucking come across. We had um, van fights, we had uh, special excursions where we had to uh, procure some fuel from somewhere because we hadn't budgeted enough diesel for the trip. Touring with Roddy in Germany, Czech Republic and Holland was pretty special for obvious reasons, getting the opportunity to tour with Roddy and uh, what a nice bloke, what a great humble bloke he was too. The only bit of the rough cuts gigs, what were, what were, what, what were planned was the, what happened when we were on stage. You'd do your sound check, you'd go on stage, you'd do your thing, you knew that was gonna be okay we get through it. It was all the stuff that went on. It was the getting to the gig. It was the getting home from the gig. It was the adventures, what went on in the gig when we weren't on stage. It was absolute chaos. And I wouldn't have changed it for the world. It was great. The music starts out into the night. At one of our Allenshire gigs, the lighting rig fell down. As I recall, hit Hazard, or fell onto him at least, and started burning him. Uh, it was a gig we played at uh, Scooter Rally, the Staffordshire Lambretta Club Scooter Rally, where the singer at the time, Johns, was leaping around and managed to brain himself on a, a low beam and knocked himself unconscious. Colin coming back in the van as we were leaving a gig dressed completely differently to how he arrived. Um, the mind boggles. To go on forever about the drunken gig journeys and the things we got up to. But, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Good times, I mean, for quite a lot about like myself. I mean, nine years of that chaos and creativity and madness. That's what you call an experience.